Hello and welcome to the Irish Haematology Oncology Podcast. I'm your host, Own Tab, and whether you're a doctor, nurse, pharmacist, or any healthcare professional working with cancer patients, this episode is for you. And this episode is coming a little later this week due to some gremlins in the recording software, but we'll hopefully be back on track from next week. And today we're diving deep into common but potentially devastating complications of cancer treatment, fetal oil neutropenia, chemotherapy-induced thrombocytopenia, and chemotherapy-induced anemia. If you've ever felt a bit unsure about what exactly these complications are, why they're such a big deal, and how to manage them effectively, you're in the right place. We'll break down medical jargon, explore the risk factors that make some patients more vulnerable, and discuss the critical steps involved in early detection and treatment. So whether you're new to oncology or just want a refresher on the fundamentals, this episode will equip you with the knowledge you need to provide the best possible care for your patients facing facing these challenging conditions. So guys, grab a cup of coffee, get comfortable, and let's um, tackle these complications together. So segment one, let's go into understanding the basics. This dissecting that intimidating term, febrile neutropenia. Well, the febrile part is straightforward. It means fever. But neutropenia is where things get a bit more complex. Think of your immune system as a well-organized army with different types of cells acting as specialized units. Neutrophils are like the frontline infantry, the first responders who rush to the scene of a bacterial or fungal invasion. They're essential for initiating the inflammatory response that helps contain and eliminate these threats. Neutropenia occurs when the number of neutrophils in your blood drops significantly below normal. This leaves your body vulnerable, like a fortress with its gates wide open. Now, why is this especially dangerous for cancer patients? Well, chemotherapy, while a powerful weapon against cancer, often comes with collateral damage. Many chemotherapy drugs suppress the bone marrow where blood cells, including neutrophils, are produced. To quantify this suppression, we use the absolute neutrophil count, or ANC. The reference range for bloods in Ireland is counted as the number of cells by 10 to the power of 9 per litre. In the USA, it's calculated as the number of cells per microliter. Basically, the Irish reference by a thousand. So you'll hear in the thousands in the USA. So be careful when looking at protocols from elsewhere with differing reference values. For simplicity today, I'll use the Irish range without saying 10 by the power of nine cells per litre each time. All right, okay, so getting that out of the way, a healthy person usually has an ANC of greater than 1.5. When it dips below 0.5, we enter the danger zone of severe neutropenia. At this point, even a minor infection can quickly escalate into a light threatening situation. Here's where the febrile part comes in. In patients with neutropenia, fever may be the only sign of a serious infection brewing. The usual signs of inflammation like redness, swelling and pus might be absent due to a lack of neutrophils. This makes febrile neutropenia a silent threat requiring heightened vigilance from healthcare providers. Let's put this into perspective with some numbers. So the ESMO guidelines, which a lot of this podcast today has been developed from, note that febrile neutropenia, while affecting around 1% of patients receiving chemotherapy, carries a significant risk of morbidity, 20 to 30%, and mortality, 10%. That means for every 100 patients undergoing chemotherapy, roughly one will develop febrile neutropenia and of those, a significant number will experience complications or even succumb to the infection. So imagine a patient named Sarah. She's a 55-year-old woman undergoing chemotherapy for breast cancer. She develops a low-grade fever a few days after her treatment. In a healthy person, this might not be a major concern. But for Sarah, with her suppressed immune system, it's a red flag. Without enough neutrophils to mount a strong defense, even a seemingly minor infection could quickly escalate into sepsis. So to recap this intro section, febrile equals fever. Neutropenia equals a low neutrophil count, especially um, ANC below 0.5. And febrile neutropenia is a fever in a patient with a low neutrophil count, often indicating a serious infection. This combination, especially in a cancer patient undergoing chemotherapy, is a medical emergency. Early recognition and prompt treatment are crucial to prevent complications and save lives. So now we'll go on to the risk factors. 
So now that we understand the basics, let's delve into the factors that increase a patient's risk of developing febrile neutropenia. It's not a one size fits all scenario. Different patients face different risk levels. Think of it like a house's vulnerability to fire. Some houses are built with fire resistant materials, while others are made of wood and have faulty wiring. So let's look at the cancer type and stage. Just as certain building materials are more flammable, some cancers inherently pose a higher risk of febrile neutropenia. Blood cancers like leukemia, lymphoma, and multiple myeloma are prime examples. These cancers directly attack, attack the bone marrow, the very place responsible for producing neutrophils. It's like having a fire break out in the fire station. Your defenses are compromised from the very start. Additionally, the stage of the cancer matters. Advanced stages often mean more extensive disease and a greater likelihood of bone marrow involvement, further increasing that risk. And the chemotherapy regimen as well. Chemotherapy drugs are powerful tools, but they can also be indiscriminate, not only targeting the cancer, but also damaging the surrounding area. Some chemotherapy regimens are more toxic to the bone marrow than others. The specific drugs used, their dosages, and the frequency of administration all contribute to the risk profile. The intensity of the treatment impacts the extent of the damage. And then there are patient-specific factors. So just as some houses are better equipped to withstand a fire, some patients are more resilient than others. Age is a significant factor, as older patients tend to have less robust bone marrow function. Other medical conditions like diabetes, kidney disease, or liver disease can also weaken the immune system, making it harder to fight off infections. Additionally, patients who have recently undergone extensive surgery or radiation therapy to areas containing bone marrow may have impaired neutrophil production. And the neutropenic in a deer, so that, this is the period following chemotherapy where the neutrophil counts are at their lowest, or also known as the nadir. It is the riskiest time for developing febrile neutropenia. This typically occurs about a week to 10 days after treatment. Oncologists and hematologists use various risk assessment tools to predict when patients are most likely to develop febrile neutropenia. The Multinational Association for Supportive Care in Cancer, or MASC, M-A-S-C-C, -C, index, for example, is a prognostic tool that considers factors like age, the presence of other medical conditions, and the severity of illness to estimate the risk of complications in patients with febrile neutropenia. As healthcare professionals, it's crucial to be aware of these risk factors. By identifying Identifying patients who are more vulnerable, we can implement preventive measures and be prepared to act swiftly if febrile neutropenia occurs. We'll talk about GCSF later on, but just to highlight here, the ESMO guidelines recommend that granulocyte colony stimulating factor, GCSF, be administered prophylactically if the risk of febrile neutropenia is greater than 20%. So looking at that mask index, if the risk is greater than 20%, that prophylactic GCSF should be used. For patients with an intermediate risk, 10 to 20%, it's also important to consider the patient's age and any coexisting morbidities. So by understanding the risk factors and taking appropriate precautions, we can help protect our patients from the potentially devastating consequences of febrile neutropenia. It's like equipping our houses with smoke detectors, fire extinguishers, and an escape plan. We're prepared for the worst, but we hope for the best. So we're going to take a little break here now before we go back into segment three, looking at early detection and action. Okay, so welcome back. Now that we know who's at risk, let's talk about the importance of early detection and rapid response. In febrile neutropenia, time is not just a factor, it's a critical determinant of patient outcomes. Think of it like a wildfire. The sooner you spot the first spark, the easier it is to contain. Delay can be disastrous. So fever, this is the body smoke alarm. For cancer patients undergoing chemotherapy, a fever isn't just a minor inconvenience. It's a blaring alarm bell signaling a potential emergency. Remember, their immune systems are often compromised, so fever could mean a serious infection is brewing, even if other typical signs of infection are absent. The importance of patient education, right? So this is where patient ed education becomes paramount. Healthcare professionals need to empower patients with the knowledge to recognize the signs of febrile neutropenia and the importance of seeking immediate medical attention. 
a simple conversation can make all the difference. And then a rapid response by our healthcare professionals. Most oncology centers have well-defined protocols for managing febrile neutropenia. These protocols are designed to ensure a swift and coordinated response, much like a well-drilled emergency team responding to a crisis. The first step is a thorough assessment of the patient's vital signs, symptoms, and medical history. This is followed by blood tests to check uh, neutrophil, count, neutrophil count, ANC, and other markers of infection. Blood cultures are also taken to identify the specific culprit, the bacteria or fungus responsible for the infection. The ESMO guidelines emphasize the importance of prompt antibiotic administration, stating that the first administration of therapy should be given in the hospital within one hour from the admission of a patient with febrile neutropenia. Delay in antibiotic administration has been associated with significant prolongation of the hospital stay and increased mortality. So let's build on from here and look at the treatment st strategies. It is a multifaceted approach. So let's look at those strategies that we employ to combat febrile neutropenia. It not only involves fighting the infection, but also supporting the patient's immune system recovery. Think of it like a multi-pronged attack plan where we deploy different weapons to tackle the problem from all angles. So antibiotics, these are the frontline warriors. They're the first line of defense against the bacterial infections that often accompany febrile neutropenia. The initial choice of antibiotic is crucial as we need to cover a broad spectrum of potential pathogens while waiting for cultures to results to pinpoint the exact culprit. It's like sending in a SWAT team to the security area before the detectives arrive to investigate. So commonly used broad spectrum antibiotics for febrile neutropenia include piperacillin tazobactam, taz, arbapenem such as meropenem, and cephalosporins like keftazidine. These antibiotics are like heavy artillery designed to take out a wide range of bacterial threats. Once the culture results are available, the antibiotic regimen can be tailored to target the specific bacteria um, identified. This is like switching from a shotgun to a sniper rifle. We can focus our firepower on this specific enemy. And then you have GCSF. So this is calling in the reinforcements, right? So in addition to antibiotics, we often use a medication called GCSF or granulocyte colony stimulating factor to help the body fight back. GCSF stimulates the bone marrow to produce more neutrophils, the white blood cells that are essential for fighting infection. It's like calling in reinforcements to bolster the weakened immune system. GCSF is typically given as a daily in injection and can significantly reduce the duration of neutropenia, thereby lowering the risk of complications. Antifungal therapy as well. So that's addressing a hidden threat. While bacteria are the usual suspects in febrile neutropenia, we can't forget about fungal infections. These infections can be more insidious and difficult to diagnose, but they pose a serious threat patients with and weakened immune systems. If a patient has risk factors for fungal infection, such as a prolonged neutropenia or recent antibiotic use, antifungal medications may be added to the treatment regimen. Common antifungal drugs used in this setting include amphotericin B, boriconazole, and posiconazole. Prophylaxis as well. So that's building a protective barrier so in some high-risk patients, we may take a proactive approach by using preventative measures to reduce the risk of febrile neutropenia. This is like building a fortress wall to keep the enemy at bay. Prophylactic GCSF can be administered around 24 hours after chemotherapy to stimulate neutrophil production and reduce the likelihood of severe neutropenia. The ESMO guideline states that several meta-analyses indicate that Primary prophylaxis with GCSF, i.e. GCSF administered immediately after cycle one of chemotherapy, reduces the risk of febrile neutropenia by at least 50% in patients with solid tumors without significantly affecting tumor response or overall survival. GCSF can come in its non-pegylated form or a pegylated form. Pegylated form is a once-off dose, whereas the non-pegylated form is that daily dosing, as I said earlier on. In some cases, prophylactic antibiotics may also be used, especially in patients with a history of recurrent infections. However, the use of prophylactic antibiotics is controversial and should be carefully considered on a case-by-case -case basis due to the risk of antibiotic resistance. So now we've finished off and we've dealt with febrile neutropenia, but there are other complications as well. While febrile neutropenia is a major concern, it's not the only hematological 
um, complication that pa cancer patients can face. Chemotherapy can also lead to thrombocytopenia and anemia, both of which require careful management. Let's take a closer look at these conditions. Thrombocytopenia, when platelets plunge, it's a condition characterized by a low platelet count. Platelets are tiny blood cells that play a cru crucial role in clotting. When platelet levels drop, patients become more susceptible to bleeding, even from minor injuries. Chemotherapy-induced thrombocytopenia, or CIT, is a common side effect of cancer treatment. It occurs when chemotherapy drugs damage the bone marrow, where platelets are produced. This can lead to a decrease in platelet production and a subsequent drop in platelet count. The NCCN guidelines define CIT as a platelet count below 100 that persists for more than three to four weeks after the last chemotherapy administration or, um, or that causes delays in chemotherapy initiation. Managing CIT involves a delicate balancing act. On one hand, we need to prevent and manage bleeding complications. On the other hand, we want to avoid unnecessary interventions that could delay or disrupt cancer treatments. Platelet transfusions are often used to temporary, temporarily increase platelet levels in patients with severe thrombocytopenia or active bleeding. However, transfusions come with their own risks, such as infection, or allergic reactions. In some cases, medications called thrombopoietin receptor agonists, or TPORAs, may be used to uh, stimulate platelet production. So Romiplastin is one such medication that has shown promise in managing CIT. However, the use of TPORAs for CIT is still under investigation and will need to be licensed before use for CIT. But just looking at the future. Then you have anemia. Anemia is the oxygen drain. Anemia is a condition characterized by a low red blood cell count or a low level of hemoglobin, which is the protein in red blood cells that carries oxygen. This can lead to fatigue, shortness of breath, and other symptoms that can significantly impact a patient's quality of life. Chemotherapy-induced anemia, or CIA, is another common side effect of cancer treatment. It occurs when chemotherapy drugs damage the bone marrow, leading to a decrease in red blood cell production. So uh, ma managing this anemia involves a multifaceted approach that aims to alleviate symptoms, improve quality of life, and maintain the patient's ability to tolerate cancer treatment. Red blood cell transfusions are often used to quickly increase hemoglobin levels in patients with severe anemia or symptomatic anemia. However, similarly to the platelet transfusions, these come with risks and should be used judiciously. Medications called, er called erythropoiesis stimulating agents, or ESAs, can be used to stimulate red blood cell production in some patients with CIA. Epoetin alpha and darogoetin alpha are two such medications that are approved for this indication. However, ESAs also carry risks, such as risks of blood, cross, blood clots, and their use should be carefully considered. Iron supplementation may also be necessary in patients with chemotherapy-induced anemia, as iron is essential for red blood cell production. Iron can be given orally or intravenously, depending on the severity of the deficiency and the patient's ability to tolerate oral iron. By addressing both thrombocytopenia and anemia, healthcare professionals can help cancer patients better tolerate their treatment and maintain a good quality, quality of life. It's like ensuring that the body's transportation system is running smoothly, delivering oxygen and clotting factors where they're needed most. Thanks a million, guys, for tuning in to the Irish Hematology Oncology podcast today. I hope this deep dive into febrile neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, and anemia has been informative and helpful for your practice. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can find a link to our feedback form in the show notes below. And don't forget, we've also included an example CPD document in the show notes for the pharmacists out there to complete for your IIOP COPD requirements. Take advantage of this resource um, as it's quite handy and easy for you to submit. Um, if doctors or nurses have any suggestions for me for how I can help them in their CPD development, um, please let me know on that um, on that feedback form or reach out, email me on irishhemonpodcast at gmail.com as well. And finally, I'm excited to announce that the Irish Hematology Oncology Podcast um, is now available on 
um, my YouTube and LinkedIn pages. So along with the video that you can get on Spotify, you can also access it on YouTube and LinkedIn. And that's from feedback that I got from people as to where they access their education from. So you can find the links to those pages in the show notes below. Um, subscribe to those channels to stay up to date on the latest episodes and other valuable content. And again, thanks a million guys for everything um, you've said so far, all the kind messages and thanks to all of you for listening in. And as always, I'll end the podcast with this important disclaimer. This podcast is for educational purposes only. Remember, the field of cancer care is always advancing and new research may lead to changes in treatment approaches or protocols. Always consult with your own team for personalized guidance and discuss any information from this podcast with them. See information from local and national resources for the most up-to-date recommendations. Thanks again, guys, and hopefully we'll be back to the normal schedule next week. All right, chat to you. Thanks.